Combating antibiotic resistance requires a cross-sectional response from medical and research communities. Joining me now to discuss the landscape of antibiotic innovation are Dr. Lillian Abbo, Professor of Infections, Infectious Diseases at the University of Miami, Dr. Christopher Burns, Founder, President, and CEO of Venatorix uh, Pharmaceuticals, and Kevin Outerson, Executive Director of CarbX, a global nonprofit partnership accelerating antibacterial products to address drug resistance bacteria. Thank you all for joining me. Uh, I want to start with Lillian. You, you're a big proponent. This is an issue I was talking to Senator Bennett. It's a scary one because it obviously deals with death. Um, but, but you lean into education. And what do you think is important to educating both the public and the providers uh, who are watching this right now? Hi, good afternoon. I think this is a very topic, important topic, very near and dear to my heart, not just because of education, but as a clinician in the front lines and as an administrator in healthcare. Education has to start early in life, as early as childhood in schools, where we educate kids that smoking has you know, consequences, we need to start educating about antibiotics. Early in life is when we learn the most. Then as we grow up high school and medical school or college, we really need to continue that level of education. And then we need to reform our medical school curriculum also to educate healthcare providers, nurses, anyone entering the force, the workforce, how to appropriately prescribe antibiotic and the consequences of inappropriate use of antibiotics. So education has to be at all levels. And then through society, public campaigns, programs like this are important. And I am a big supporter of the Pasteur Act because that will also provide through Congress and through you know, health and human services, a pathway to allocate funds and resources for education and antimicrobial stewardship programs. Kevin, uh, HHS recently announced a $300 million grant uh, to CARBACs. Can you describe that and, and what you'll be doing as part of that project? Oh, I think uh, we can't hear you. It's, it's the way of the world. I'm saying that uh, there you go. we also have $70 million in the Welcome Trust that was announced on the same day. But uh, Carbex exists because the, the small companies in this space are not getting the private investment they need. And so we're, we're non-dilutive. We make grants. We also support the companies with the technology and experts so that uh, in five or 10 years from now, we're not sitting around wondering why we don't have any antibiotics on the shelf that are available and useful. And how long has this been in, in the works? Uh, Carbex was uh, founded in 2016 with the largest public private partnership in the world um, supporting antibacterial innovation. And to date, we've uh, funded companies in 12 countries, 92 projects total, uh, about $365 million spent as of today. And so we're really grateful for our funders coming back and renewing our ability to support projects going forward. Christopher Burns, where are we big picture on this? And, and what do you see uh, that policymakers should be doing more? Where are we on funding? Where are we on legislation? Uh, Lillian mentioned the Pasteur Act. Uh, where do you think we are kind of from a big picture, 30,000 feet? So, so to give the background, you, you know, when we started 12 years ago, we were just three people. And um, we were trying to invent new drugs. So we were at the beginning of the story. Now, 12 years later, some of the things we've invented um, have made it all the way through the clinical trials and are ready to be filed for approval and commercialization. So, so I think each party looks at this from a different angle. Um, clearly, we've been very successful at putting um, what they call push incentives in place, like, like, like Kevin's uh, Carbex, which we've been beneficiaries of where you innovate, you invent something you new, you start to bring it to the later and later uh, stages of development and then pre-commercial. I think what we're all conceding is that there's a bit of a cliff and, um, and each new innovation reaches the edge of the cliff and looks across the chasm and, and is trying to figure out how to get to sustainability because sustainability at the end of the day is the key to all of this. And so, and so I think where we're still struggling is from, from the cliff beyond, if you want. You know, you, you get new, new innovations, you, you bring them through the clinic, 
And then um, all those push incentive dollars start to dry up and, and you find yourself alone trying to, um, to bridge to commercial sustainability, profitability. I mean, without that, you're not going to get investor dollars. And so I think what Pasteur is trying to do is say, look, um, if you can get this far, we will help bridge you across the chasm and we will help get you to sustainability by, by, help, by helping you, um, you know, until you can fly on your own, basically. Mm -hmm. And there's really only a couple of other pools of capital right now that can do that. Um, and one is within BARDA, uh, which is a procurement angle through BioShield. And the other is a new, a new pool of capital that has been formed by the pharma companies called the AMR Action Fund. And those would have the opportunity to participate in the, in the later part of the cycle, um, maybe more than the early part. Uh, Lillian, you're a regional and, and national expert on, on COVID-19. What have we learned on the ground um, on other policy issues? You know, we have so much going on. We've got a pandemic. Uh, we're talking about antibiotic resistance, but we're also, you know, mental health is a big challenge now. Opioids is a big challenge now. Um, what have we learned over the last two plus years? Wow, uh, we have learned a lot. And as you very well know, there has been a lot of mistrust, right? both in politics and in healthcare. So we really need to start rebuilding our society and rebuilding that trust. We have been, our healthcare expenditures have dramatically increased. We're spending about 19% of our GDP in healthcare and healthcare in America, the quality of life is not necessarily the best in the world. We're spending over $4.5 billion every year in managing six of the most resistant bugs. So as, as we hear, we really need to take the lessons from this pandemic, where are we spending our dollars and what's the value that we're bringing to our society to improve the longevity and the quality of care. I think it's really important to also understand that spending dollars on prevention is extremely important. And that's part of it is breaking the infection control, the chain of transmission of superbugs, using these innovations and technology also to focus on prevention, really preventing the resistance and targeting these drugs that we really need to give the best value to patients. And also very important, we've learned in the last two years, the social determinants of health, right? We have a big opioid crisis, a big mental health crisis, all of this intersects. If we don't treat these underlying conditions, if we don't look at our rural areas, if we don't look at the access to care in our counties, in what do we do in our safety net hospitals, we're really not gonna solve this crisis. We really are seeing this problem across all races, religions, economic status. So it's really focusing that every part of society is important and we all need to work on this together. It's doable, but we really need to focus on value, not just throwing dollars. It's really how are we allocating those funds to improve the quality of care. Kevin, you recently said antibiotics are unlike other medicines. As bacteria evolve to become resistant, the problem keeps getting worse. We have to run faster just to avoid falling behind. What pace are we running at today, and is the bacteria faster? <clears throat> Whether it's bacteria or coronavirus, they just adapt, they evolve. And so every time that we do something with a, a clever you know, intervention, we have to be thinking about the future. If uh, somebody invented a wonderful cancer drug, that cancer drug should work forever. But um, the best antibiotic we will we'll have ever seen as soon as it's introduced, we need to be inventing its replacement. And uh, so that's one of the reasons why things are so hard in this space. It's, it requires us to be uh, keeping ahead of uh, the longest foe of humanity. I mean, think of the Black Plague. You know, you know bacteria have really uh, had their way with humanity. And it's only in the past couple generations that we've had these amazing drugs that enable our modern civilization to be possible. Uh, good luck doing cancer treatment or knee surgery or cesarean sections. All those things would be more dangerous mm -hmm. without antibiotics. And so it's really worth protecting. Uh, just a quick follow up on that, Kevin. As you said you work with other uh, countries. Uh, what, what have you learned from them? Anything surprising of what other countries are doing? And uh, how, how do we stack up? Well, the, the ideas behind the Pasteur Act uh, have been coming, have been talked around in, in various countries for a number of years. 
Uh, I'm, a, I'm a strong supporter of the Sempester Act. Uh, but England, um, the United Kingdom kind of, uh, you know, got ahead of the game and actually has implemented uh, this subscription idea behind the Pasteur Act and announced the, the first two drugs in their program uh, last year, or in, in a, now implementing it today. That's great news, but the English economy is, is fairly small compared to the rest of the world. And it's not enough by itself to do anything useful for antibiotic innovation. It works as an example, and it works if other countries like the US you know, comes and follows suit. So I'm, I'm hopeful that countries that represent the largest markets of the world can work together and actually get this done. Because that's how we'll make uh, companies like the one that Chris Burns leads and, and many others not go off the cliff into oblivion. It's, it's tragedy when great science works for a decade and then gets crushed because of bad economics that uh, really we can do something about with Pasteur. Um, Chris, you've gone through, you mentioned clinical trials and you've gone through the, the kind of government process. What, what makes you the, the most apprehensive about the way we approach drug development and, and is there a way for, for the process to be streamlined? You know, I think on the, develop, on the development front, um, I, I think the FDA in the last five years has been um, incredibly flexible and incredibly helpful. Um, to, to understand that we're in a capital constrained environment, that what, what is sufficient on the risk benefit uh, uh, scenario is X instead of X times three. And so I think that that's been very helpful. Uh, we always look forward uh, to the FDA being, uh, being a partner uh, with us in that front. And I think they've, they've shown that they're willing to do that. Um, you, you know, people like me, we spend all of our days trying to find the capital to to advance, you know, to to show what the drugs can do. Um, and so we tend to gravitate always back to the capital rather than the, the, the development, the science, even though we're all scientists by training. Um, but I, I, I do think I do think it's a you know, it's a partnership between the policymakers in terms of funding uh, the development, funding the to be honest, what happens after development is finished, and then the FDA uh, maintaining itself as a productive partner in the equation. Uh, Lillian, we have a question for you from one of our viewers. This is from Karen Sassa, owner of something called Focus, P-H-O-C-U-S. And she asked about education. Uh, how are we educating prescribers on stewardship, on prescribing appropriate therapy? How can pharmacists play a role in making sure physicians pre are prescribing the right way and appropriately? Uh, wonderful question, and I am a big proponent of pharmacists. Pharmacists are our right and left hand uh, in clinical care. I think everyone uh, plays a role, again, from medical education, pharmacy schools, all the way to the front lines, right? Anyone in any pharmacy, whether you're in an outpatient pharmacy or working at a hospital, has a role. We really need to focus on antimicrobial stewardship programs. The ID Society of America and the Society of Healthcare Epidemiology of America have wonderful guidelines. Um, I'm part of those guidelines. We have really carved out what are the components. We have curriculum for education of residents, students, and we have curriculum for infectious disease uh, providers in training, also in antimicrobial stewardship. So that's part of the education, a really in teaching people how to prescribe. Using the example of cancer, you cannot prescribe chemotherapy unless you are an oncologist. Nobody will give you a, a, you know, a chemotherapy drug without the expertise. Anyone can prescribe an antibiotic. So really pharmacies have a very important role at the front lines educating, but we as doctors, we also need to do our part and hold ourselves accountable. So that's, that's the role of stewardship. It's really using these valuable drugs in the best way. I always use the example of, we don't do anything with new drugs if we don't know how to take care of them. It's like giving your alcoholic patient a different kind of brandy, a more refined uh, you know, alcohol. You really need to teach people how to drink, not just serve them a different drink. Uh, Kevin, as far as the urgency here, you know, on, on, on a variety of issues that, especially in Washington, uh, everyone talks about the urgency of, of climate change and, and other issues that we must act now. How important is it to, to act now on this and, and perhaps pass the Pasteur Act uh, as quickly as possible in a bipartisan way? 
But it was mentioned earlier in, in this broadcast, 1.27 million people dying now of drug resistant bacteria. It's killing people mainly, you know, around the world, not necessarily uh, in the United States, you know, tens of thousands of the U.S., but uh, over a million worldwide, killing more people than HIV and malaria. Uh, you know, why, why isn't that getting our top tier attention? But also what's happening is that every day we see and we hear the stories of small teams, science teams, research companies, some of which have been together for a decade, um, having to break up, um, going off into other fields. Uh, the, the, the intellectual capacity of the world to create new antibiotics is being diminished every day. It's a crisis for these little companies. And eventually that becomes a crisis for all of us. You know, if, if we'd lost the last person who knew how to do calculus, you know, we're losing people who know how to make an essential part of civilization that must be renewed every generation or else uh, we'll, we'll slip back into the pre-antibiotic era. So, you know, it's urgent on so many levels, people dying, teams dying, and uh, the future need to keep us all safe. We have run out of time for this segment. I want to uh, thank our panelists, Dr. Lillian Abbo, Professor Infectious Diseases at the University of Miami, Dr. Christopher Burns, founder and president and CEO of Venetrix uh, Pharmaceuticals, and Kevin Adderson, Executive Director of Carbex. Thank you so much. Great, great discussion.